Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy, and it is brilliant to be beachside alongside Joe Stanley, Dr. Nick Carr, and Jackie Felgate. Hello, Darcy. <laughs> Another tough day in the office, too. Isn't it absolutely glorious? We love being out in nature, and actually, nature is responsible for a recent revolution and an Australian world first in the treatment of mental health. That's right, Joe. Psychedelics. Australia has become the first country in the world to recognise them as a medicine for depression and PTSD. And Nick, so fascinating. Yes, yeah, so from July this year, approved practitioners will be able to prescribe MDMA and psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, mm. for people with certain complex mental health conditions. And Nick, I've been following this fairly closely over a long period of time. Back in the 60s, there was an enormous amount of research into the fact that this, the psychedelics for PTSD and mental health were making a significant difference. And then the former US President Richard Nixon came along and said, war on drugs. <laughs> and it ended, didn't it? Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a long history of using psychedelics in treatments in medicine. But it's not to say you're going to be able to just pop into your doctor and say, hey, can I get a script of Molly? <laughs> I was going to see you this week, actually. <laughs> no, not going to happen. It's going to be highly regulated and only approved practitioners. Now, of course, science is becoming increasingly aware of the link between your gut health and mental health as well, isn't it? Yes, so 30 years years ago, I never used to talk to patients about their diet and their mental health. But now we're increasingly interested in how healthy diet creates a healthy gut microbiome, which produces all these nice anti-inflammatories and other chemicals, which are really good for mental health. Just another example of when you have a sense that something's not right with your health starts with a feeling in your gut. When most people think gut, they think belly. But the gut starts from when the first mouthful of pasta goes in to when it comes out the other end. Tens of trillions of good and bad bacteria live in your gut. Upset the balance and you'll notice some problems, physical and emotional. Your gut is nine metres long. If it was laid out flat, it'd cover an entire tennis court. The acid produced in your stomach can burn your skin. But on the inside, it's a digestive powerhouse. The gut is called the second brain. If the nerve that connects the two was cut, both would work independently. Stress affects your gut. It can upset your digestion and decrease good bacteria. Eat more fermented foods like yogurt and sauerkraut. They keep the bad bacteria in line. Your gut needs to sleep too. More good bacteria means better sleep. If you find yourself here more than once a day, there's no problem. Three times a day is normal. And when you get the gut feeling about something, then listen. After all, your gut is your second brain. The gut really is fascinating, isn't it? Who would have thought that it's the length of a tennis court? And people often forget that digestion starts in the mouth with saliva, which aids that process. And we produce anywhere between two and six cups every day, which is between a half and one and a half litres. <laughs> is a lot of spit. It makes me feel a bit queasy. But is it true, too, that on average a man's gut is longer than a woman's? Uh, Joe, it's not all about how long it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's but definitely what, true. Have you, heard about, have you heard about what's called the blue poop? Challenge. Can't say I have, Dr. No. Nick. No. So this is a study where they've asked thousands of people to eat blue muffins, and then they've watched how long it takes for that blue dye to go from the start to the finish. <laughs> and what they found is that that what's called transit time tells you a lot about the health of the gut microbiome. So how long are we talking? Well, so the average length of time was about 28 hours. Seems like a long time. <laughs> That's a fair bit to digest. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But of course, if you want to know about the health of your gut, the most important important thing is what comes out at the other end. And who best to tell us about that than the gut guru himself, Dr Ho. So poo itself is really interesting. Contrary to popular belief, poo is not just waste product that you expel. What's exciting about poo is it's teeming with lots of microbes. We know that about 75% of poo is water, 25% of poo is solids. And of that 25%, it's mainly made up of organic matter, which is living matter. About 50% of that organic matter is actually microbes. We're talking about bacteria and viruses. So there are actually billions of bacteria in your uh, average stool. We can determine a lot from someone's poo. We can tell um, how healthy that person may be from 
the microbes in the gut. And what I mean by that is that we know that certain conditions are linked to particular changes in microbes. So there's been a lot of research linking, for example, conditions like diabetes and obesity to changes in your bacterial population, your gut microbiota. Research has shown us that there is a profile of microbes which are reflected in good health. It can also inform us about strategies to help improve gut health. For example, the use of certain probiotics can be really beneficial in helping to correct the gut microbiota, particularly if there's an imbalance. Also, we know there are some interventions like fecal microbial transplantation, which is where poo from a healthy person transplanted to someone who has a particular health, health condition, that can lead to a correction of that imbalance. It can lead to a boost in that microbial diversity. So prior to 1997, um, when we describe stool itself, we would use terms such as watery, loose, hard. But in 1997, the Bristol stool chart became the gold standard go-to guide for evaluating stool form. We know that there are seven different uh, categories for the Bristol stool chart. Number one refers to very hard stool, pebble-like, almost like a nugget. Bristol form two itself is hard, but sausage-like. Then we've got Bristol school three and four. So three itself is sausage-like with some cracks, and four is sausage-like, but is very soft. And three and four are considered to be the ideal forms of stool that people often strive for. Stool five is where we've got soft blobs with very clear defined edges. Stool six is where there's mushy stool with ragged edges. And stool seven, just watery form. There was some really good research that was, that was published um, looking at 5,000 adults in the United States. And what this study showed was that 90% of men would have a stool consistency between three and five, whereas for women, the consistency varied from two to six. We should be looking uh, at our stool on a pretty regular basis. And the reason why that's important is because not only can stool consistency give us an idea about diarrhea, uh, constipation, and irritable bowel syndrome, which can be reflected in both constipation and diarrhea, but also we can look for the presence of blood in the stool, which is really important because it may signify conditions such as colorectal cancer. Um, it could be from benign conditions such as hemorrhoids, uh, but we've got to rule out the more serious conditions. Uh, the presence of dark tarry stool is important because it may signify a bleed from the upper gut, such as a stomach ulcer. And conditions like that should always uh, prompt referral to a, to a doctor. I know it sounds a bit icky, but really we should all be having a good look at our poo mm. and we should be teaching our children to do it too. Look, I have to say I love Dr Ho's enthusiasm. Yes. But, and I try to be mature about this, <laughs> but I just can't get past... There's somehow blockage for me. <laughs> yeah, but it, is, but it is important that really we should all have the <laughs> blockage. <laughs> I, just, I just got that. <laughs> but really we should all have the Bristol stool chart up on the wall in our loo. But I have to confess, in right. our house, in our house, my wife has it plastered with Italian verbs. Oh, yeah, fancy! For her, for her homework. <laughs> that is fancy. Dr Nick, it's time that we rolled up our sleeves again. Yes, that now the recommendation is anyone who hasn't had COVID infection or a vaccination in the last six months, time for another booster. And the nation's immunisation authority also recommends that anyone 65 and over should have the COVID jab this year. And let's face it, Nick, we're all getting a little bit older. Yeah, older and some of us a bit wiser. Oh, yeah. I'll take that. But actually <laughs> what I meant is the world as a whole is getting older. Well, you're right, Joe, because by 2050, a quarter of the world's population will be over the age of 65. Uh, but we are actually living a little bit healthier longer. Well, I'm actually inspired by a group who have taken up one of the most difficult activities when it comes to core strength, classical ballet. When Wendy Crellin from the Victorian seaside town of Wonthaggy turned 80 last year, having lost her husband John a few years earlier, she realised her life was lacking a certain spark. I was yearning for something that would give joy to me and make my life full, if you like. 
I don't know if older people revert back to the things that they loved when they were young. I don't know, maybe that's what it was. This is my last chance, you know, to do something that I really love. That something was ballet. A passion for Wendy ever since she trained at one of Australia's most prestigious dance academies as a teenager. But after going on to set up her own dance school in Wonthaggy, Wendy reluctantly stepped back from the bar to focus on her family. With three small children and a husband who was never home, I couldn't keep going without someone else to support me. So after a number of years, I, I just closed that. And um, I was um, unhappy, if you like, sad. And uh, I thought, I think I'll go back and do a ballet class. And out and in. In. I thought, well, if nobody comes, it doesn't matter. I'll still do a ballet class. With the support of her local council, Wendy began offering weekly ballet classes to seniors free of charge. Point close. Within a few short months, it became the talk of the town. Two, close. Wendy Crellin is the most energetic, enthusiastic person you're likely to meet. And she encouraged us to join her, her ballet class. No, she encouraged you to join <laughs> the ballet class. And I was conned into a flexible exercise routine, not ballet. Forward, side, back. I think they like coming here because it's informal. There's no mirrors to be seen. There's no certificates and there's no medals and there's no performance. You just work at your own pace. Out and back. You're clever. She's very patient. At the same time, she asks a lot of us, but in our own pace and our own way. So it's really suit different levels of fitness and body shapes and everything. <laughs> the vast majority of Wendy's students had no prior dancing experience, but it hasn't taken long for them to notice significant physical benefits. So in my case, actually, I was feeling really a lack of flexibility. And I probably shouldn't say this on national television, but I found it really hard to put my knickers on. I'd have to sit on the edge of the bed and lean over and then, you know, wiggle them on up like this. I can put my knickers on now by standing up, so that's a real positive. And balance has been something that we've noticed the difference. When we first started and up on your toes and things like that, forget it. After having treatment for, for breast cancer and while I was having radiotherapy breaking my ankle, I was just sitting. I was, I was doing nothing. I'm still not back to where I was before, but uh, it's getting there and ballet's been one of the things that's really helped with that. Just over a year since they started, Wendy's classes have grown so popular, she now offers two lessons a week. And while her students are grateful to have such an experienced instructor, Wendy reckons she gets more out of each lesson than anybody else. I love to see the joy on their faces. I love to be able to see that they can hear music and they can feel the passion in the music and their bodies respond to that. I love that they're individual people, but they're a unit. Beautiful. Doesn't matter, I don't mind which way you swivel. Here she is, I think she's 80, and, um, and she's just so sprightly, and you think, gracious me, can I work to that? Can I work up to that? Five, six, seven, and wait. I returned to the things that I loved and that was to dance and to share, share that joy of dancing. Now up. <laughs> little, little, medium.
Joe, you know, I love the beach and I look out at the beautiful Portfield Bay right now. I can think of nothing better than jumping in for a swim. And in fact, I'm going to do that before the day's over. It is absolutely beautiful. But actually, just out there, you wouldn't know it, but is one of Australia's most treacherous stretches of ocean. It's called the Rip, literally the Rip, and it's three kilometres wide. And we've seen 30 or more boats have disappeared in that part of the water. As you said, it's deceiving. You're in the bay, looks calm, but that is one of the world's most treacherous stretches of water a bit further out. Well, most Australians live on or by the coast. And so it's absolutely critical that we understand the dangers of our waterways and, of course, how to swim. I came to Australia about 10 years ago in 2009 and I was so excited because all I heard Australia is famous for the beautiful beaches. And really you want to go and dip into the water, but uh, there was a fear of drowning because uh, I read the newspaper, watch TV or Facebook news, we, we know that there's a lot of drownings happening. Growing up in Pakistan, Fahim Sherms never learnt to swim, but he was desperate to overcome his fear. Once you decided to stay in Australia, you build a family, I've realised that uh, knowing what to separate is very important. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Bezot, and I will help you out today for instructing a water safety. Everyone ready to get in? Let's go! Let's go, guys. When I heard about this program, the first thing was that at least I'd be able to go into the water, not, not very deep, but at least I'd be able to float or trade water or do some basic safety things. On the same wave is a free program run by Peter Taylor at West Beach, teaching refugees and migrants the basics of water safety. How to go into the water, uh, how to find the right places to go to the water. Obviously, swimming between the flags is where we want everyone to swim, and we teach that as our main aim. But yet, if they can identify what a rip or a gutter and sandbar, then it'll help them in maintaining their own safety once they're down on the beach. But the program doesn't stop there. Our main aim is to teach people how to swim, uh, how to get involved with surf life saving and become a surf life saver themselves. So then hopefully they can then go back within their own communities and start teaching uh, what's safe to them. Surf instructor Bezard Padarab jumped right in. Because Iran is a landlocked country, swimming is not very common down there. So same as many Iranians, I couldn't swim. At Mario River, I was canoeing with a few of my friends. All of a sudden, my canoe turned over, and even though I had a life jacket, I just it was close to drown. And that was another big, head, big kick to my head. I said, all right, this is not right. I'm here, I'm surrounded by water. It's good to learn how to swim. But once I learned it, it was much comfortable feeling. I could just be safe. That's why I'm passionate about it, to teach it to other people and share the feeling with them and just make them just enjoy as much as they can. Just check the map, make sure that there's nothing plugged in the airway. Nope, nothing in there, all good, OK. Patrolling officer Cecile Saidi grew up in a refugee camp in Tanzania. I remember myself that the first time that I saw a beach uh, when we came from outside of the refugee, I was really shocked to see a large body of water in one place. Um, I had never seen that before. So at first it's just mind-blowing. You, you don't associate water with danger because you drink water, you clean yourself in water. So when you see a large body of water in one place, it just blows your mind and then when you get your body in the water and you find yourself in trouble, then, you know, then you learn that, oh, I can actually get in trouble. And so people can, you know, be a bit ignorant about the dangers. Well done. With migrants making up nearly 30% of drownings in Australia, Peter knows there's more work ahead. The only real thing that we can do is to be more proactive and get out to the communities uh, and, and try and uh, help them understand the dangers of water. They will not come to us, so we need to be very proactive in getting out to them and, and helping the communities. But for the numerous people Peter has already helped, I think it's a priceless. It is, it is the one of the best uh, moment when you swim in the water, in the ocean, during the summer sunset or early in the morning. It is a priceless. I cannot really put into the words that how happy I am that I know that uh, I know the safety things. It is a huge achievement for me to wearing this clothes. It's an honor serving community. I cannot describe my feeling by words. It's all about its happiness, excitement, and how I can help other people.
I promise you, no pun intended, but that water program is having a seriously good flow-on effect. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that that information is being passed on, Joe, to other members of the community in a really positive way. Oh, it is a fantastic program that has now spread to beaches all around the country, so just head online to On The Same Wave for more information. There are, of course, lots of hidden dangers in the ocean, but, Dr Nick, perhaps one of the greatest risks is something we can't see. Yes, well, you're absolutely right, Jake, because a big new study published in the prestigious medical journal with the Lancet has shown that bacterial infections are now the second leading cause of death, only, only topped by heart disease still. This is so amazing. Mm. You hear so much about stroke and heart disease, but never anything about microscopic bugs. <laughs> well, but, but oh over the God. course of human history, infection has actually always been one of our biggest killers, whether it's viruses, parasites like malaria or bacteria. But what this study shows is the bacteria are still a really huge problem. What about then our over-reliance on things like antibiotics? Yeah, well, that is true in some of our westernised countries, but actually worldwide, the biggest problems are with malnutrition, poor water quality, uh, lack of access to effective vaccines and antibiotics. So bacterial infection really is our next global health challenge. And I like to think, uh, Nick, that Australian ingenuity will play a role in helping to fix that, as we have done so often in the past. Well, up next, House of Wellness' own superhero, Heinze, is going to take one for the team, and I mean <laughs> literally. You need to see this right after the break. Hydrated skin is healthy skin. For that plump, glowy complexion, the ingredient we're looking for is hyaluronic acid. It's a tricky one to say, but it has a significant contribution to skincare, helping to keep our skin hydrated due to its ability to hold up to a thousand times its molecular weight in water. The Swiss Beauty Glow Booster Duo combines the power of two times hyaluronic acid in a beauty from the inside out format. The Swiss Beauty Collagen and Hyaluronic Acid Booster Supplement contains ingestible hyaluronic acid known as sodium hyaluronate. Also included are skin-loving ingredients such as collagen to maintain skin elasticity and vitamin C to maintain skin firmness from within. To further support your skin from the outside, we compare the supplement with the Swiss 2% Hyaluronic Acid Vitamin B5 Glow Booster Serum. Intense hydration is locked in for visibly plumper, smoother skin. It's the best time to be a skincare fanatic like me because there's more understanding and more education than ever before. But now we need to prioritise it. After all, it's the longest relationship we'll ever have. Well, from loving your skin to checking what's beneath it, so, Joe, I understand you've already had a little gift from the government. Can you tell us about that? That's Ooh. right. I did turn 50 last year, and so the government sent me my bowel screening kit. And I've got to say, aren't we fortunate Ooh. to have a government that sends us such a present? And I did... <laughs> put it in my drawer for about four weeks, but I did end up doing it. Well, it's actually really good that you did because only about 40% of people, that's those aged 50 to 74, actually do the test and send it back. I think that's frustrating for health professionals because the evidence is there. If you detect bowel cancer early, mm. it is very uh, treatable. So what under you, Joe? Well, I will admit you have to sort of put aside the ick factor, but Obviously, why wouldn't you screen yourself if you can? And it's really simple. The step-by-step -step instructions are there. Mm. You only have to have a tiny little bit of a sample, so it's actually not as bad as you imagine. Well, we all know that the gut and the bowel are our hardest workers, and this week, Heinze checks his into a day spa for a detox that goes deep. Looking after your gut is so important to our overall health. One alternative modality you could consider doing to take care of it is a colonic irrigation. Now, some of the benefits can include removing excess waste, reducing gas or bloating, and an overall feeling of lightness and increased energy. Jaya, in its simplest terms, what is colonic irrigation? So a colonic is when you cleanse the colon, which is our large intestine or our large bowel, from waste. So what sits in there is our stool, otherwise known as poo. We've got bacteria, yeast, undigested food and all of the weird and the wonderful. Now, from what I understand, there's different methods of colonic irrigation. That's right. And you specialise in Woods Gravity. What's that? 
So Wood's gravity is a method where we don't fill the colon with any water. It's a very manual and natural way to have a colonic. And one thing I really want to make clear is that a colonic should never be painful. So whilst it's not the most comfortable procedure, the benefits outweigh that. So peristalsis are the muscular contractions of the digestive system. Yep. And they're, what, they're like wave-like motions that propel the waste in your colon into the rectum and into the toilet. What I'm actually doing and what happens during a colonic is that we activate those muscular contractions. So mm. we're stimulating bowel movements, essentially. When we talk about gut health, we often refer to it as our second brain. There's yeah. a huge connection there mm. in our immune system, our mental health. Can you tell me it's not just about what we eat, it's what we absorb that's and if right. we've got our gut out of order, That's right. then we're not going to absorb our nutrients. That's right. So a really big focus for us is ensuring that our microbiome is actually balanced. So our balance of friendly and unfriendly bacteria. So colonics are great for helping to clear imbalances and to keep our gut lining strong. And it's really interesting because oftentimes a lot of people think if you're unhealthy, that's why you need a colonic, but people who do lead a healthy lifestyle will still benefit and do need colonics as well. And what is the sign of a good colonic? Look, as a colon therapist, it's very satisfying to watch what comes out. So I like to see a lot of movement and a lot of gas come out. Actually, you'd be quite um, surprised. When a lot of stuff doesn't come out, that usually means we've got a lot of work to do. So a healthy colon is one that removes a lot of waste. All right, so that feeling is now we've moved waste into the rectum. Have we? But I need you to breathe. I think there's a bit of tensing, which is normal. And I'm also trying to work out that balance between releasing and not pushing. That's right. No, you're doing well. Honestly, these are all normal feelings for someone having a colonic for the first time because it's very new sensations, but there's also a fear of the unknown. So you're seeing waste come out? I have. I've seen it a little bit. We're still working on the bigger stuff, to be honest, yeah. which we'll get to. Nice deep breath, Luke. Doing great. Excellent. Nice deep breath. So they say after you've had colonic irrigation that you can feel lethargic, lightheaded, but I feel the complete opposite. I feel so energised, like I could take on anything. I'm going to absolutely nail this day. Now, I almost feel a bit embarrassed that I was, you know, nervous or self-conscious at the beginning because there was nothing to feel that way about. I felt comfortable the entire time. It was a strange sensation, yes. Uncomfortable? No, not at all. I feel so, so good and I'll definitely be back. Well, Jack, a lot of today is about water safety. How young did you get your kids into the water? As early as I possibly could. I just loved having them down at the local pool for swimming lessons. They both enjoyed it. And I think not just from a water safety perspective, but also from a self-esteem and confidence point of view as well, having them in and around the water. And that is absolutely true of one of our greatest young athletes. Melissa Wu was the youngest ever Olympic diver to compete in Olympic Games and also the youngest ever diver to win an Olympic medal. That's right, and we caught up with her just before she headed over to the Birmingham Commonwealth Games where she won gold in the synchro with her partner, Charlie Petrov. Melissa's had her fair share of adversity and setbacks over the journey, but she's a great example of why you should never be afraid, Jack, to dive in at the deep end. My sister was a swimmer. She was quite good when she was young, so we spent a lot of time around the swimming pool and she raced a lot at Sydney Olympic Park. So we went to watch her on the weekends and that's where I first saw diving and I was just amazed by it. From the second I saw it, I wanted to start. I started diving in Sydney and then I moved with my family to the Gold Coast and then to Brisbane when I was around 11, 12-ish. So then from 12 to 13, that was a bit of a sort of, yeah, really fast incline and I got into an elite squad in Brisbane, got to train with the divers that had just come back and won medals from the Athens Olympics and that's when I really started taking it seriously and put my head down and made the goal of making Commonwealth Games at 13 and, and I managed to do it. 
for years and years. So I was obsessed with Beijing and going to the Olympics and my whole room was covered in, you know, Olympic sort of memorabilia and everything and I, and I really wanted to do it. So being able to actually make that team was, was amazing for me. I was really, really excited and I had my family go and watch. So I'm half Chinese, so I had my dad and my grandpa and my sister there and that was really special. And it, it was cool because it was my first games, but at the same time I had a bit more pressure on me than, than my first Commonwealth Games. So I did find that a little bit challenging as well and they kept me on a pretty tight leash. So winning the medal was, I was really happy, but also a bit of relief as well when I when I actually hit that goal. And it was a goal that I had, but also my coaches and the program and everything too. And here we are, Melissa Wu, the queen of the 10 meter platform, forward three and a half somersaults pike. Oh, she does it again. I've had stress fractures in my back, I've got disc bulge, I've got a few back injuries, but it's just about sort of managing it. I don't have anything major at the moment, but there's a lot of niggles that are always there in the background. I'm always just mindful of, so I think it's taken me a while to learn to manage them, but I've been lucky to find a really good physio who's helped me out a lot with that, and she's sort of found that they're all connected in certain ways and got me a lot stronger. And I think one of the things that uh, she's really helped me with is just that you become so over-specialised in your sport that often the injuries you accumulate just from doing the same movements over and over. So. It's almost like we focus on doing the opposite sort of movements and, and strengthening the opposing muscle groups and that's helped me to get stronger but also prevent further injuries and, and manage the injuries that I have better. I did find it difficult at a young age to fit in with the group that I was with. It was a lot of older members of the squad and we would go to international competitions and I found it hard to relate to them. And I think too, the program was a bit, it wasn't a great environment and we were sort of pitted against each other quite a bit as well. So I think that that played a big part too. But I think then for me, the motivation then to go and compete and achieve my diving goals was when I got to go overseas and meet other athletes my own age. And that was a pretty cool experience to, to be like, okay, there's people just like me from other countries that are, you know, diving and putting everything into it and making all these sacrifices with school and other things. And then they were friends that I've just had, you know, they've been my lifelong friends now and that was a bit of a turning point for me when I when I felt like it was all worth it, all the hours I was putting in and feeling that I didn't necessarily have people to relate to. I finally sort of found my people and it made me, I think, fall in love with the sport even more. Oh, and there it is. Oh my gosh, we might get some tens from her. Surely a ten from the judges in that time. Mindset's been a huge thing for me and it has been, yes, to do with performance and being a performer, but I feel like that is all sort of wrapped up in mental health and how you're feeling about yourself, your confidence, your self-belief. So when I started working with my psychologist, we actually just kind of stripped everything back and worked on me as a person first and got me feeling better about myself, more confident, and I found that that sort of translated over the diving and that's when I started to see improvements in my performance as well. But it is something that I, I feel like I have to work at a lot and you can get a bit complacent sometimes and think, oh, I've done it, now, I'm, now I'm good, but it's like training. We come here and we keep training physically over and over again. And I really feel like mindset is the same thing. You've got to keep training and you can't just stop, otherwise you sort of lose it as well. Losing my sister Kirsten was really, really hard for, for me and my whole family. I think it's a thing that doesn't really, I don't feel like it gets better with time. It's almost harder because it's longer since you've seen the person. And that's something that we still sort of struggle to deal with, I think, and sometimes are harder than others. But I think for me, having diving and something to focus on really helped me through that period. Because at that point, I didn't really think about diving necessarily and leaving the sport, but I just literally, in the morning when I got up, I didn't know how to keep going with life. I didn't know, I didn't want to do anything. So it wasn't necessarily just diving, it was just everything. She really taught me that you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the day after. So just live in the moment and don't leave anything, you know, out there. Just give 100% to every day and, and then gradually you move forward and, and you learn from it. COVID was a, probably a good and bad thing for me. It was good in that I had a bit of extra time to actually prepare for, for competition because I was actually really injured in 2020. So I wasn't really going to get any competitions in before Olympic trials. And even though I was struggling physically, I was also really struggling mentally and I wasn't really confident that I would have to just go into an Olympic trials having not competed for about a year and then try and make the team. So I actually started off pretty, pretty bad. I had a few really bad comps and I was actually glad that, that happened because it kind of gave me that kick up the butt to really get on top of my mindset and then I basically just yeah gave it everything and I sort of had this plan of this is how long I've got to trials this is how long to Olympics and I think that that was a thing that sort of you know got me through trials but then also helped me get that really good result in Tokyo. No athlete can achieve an Olympic medal on their own and that medal I think for me symbolised everybody that helped me get there and so I was just that moment on the dais was just such an incredible feeling.
Oh, Melissa Wu, how good is she? And I loved hearing her talk about her mindset and the strength that you need to compete at that level. Unbelievable. And obviously, Das, you've been an elite athlete, whereas <laughs> not so much we're professional we're athletes ourselves. <laughs> but when it comes to the hours and hours of training, mm. the early mornings, that commitment, very much your department, not mine. <laughs> you say that with an element of surprise, Joe. Like, it's a long time ago, but <laughs> can I uh, say you might have to get used to the early morning alarm as well because there's a study out at the moment suggesting that the early morning time of the day is the best time to burn fat. And scientists actually looked at this in mice and found those that moved and exercised earlier actually ha increased their metabolism. Well, that is fascinating. Early morning's not the favourite thing <laughs> either. But, you know, fashion fads come and go, but when it comes to good gut health, green food never goes out of fashion. Here's Heinze and Zoe. You know I'm an open book, Zoe, so while we're creating a recipe, I don't mind talking about things that aren't quite food-related. I'm talking bloating, oh. gas, <laughs> stomach cramps, even a sluggish bowel. I hope this isn't a warning of what's to come when I try your recipe, Luke. Oh, what are you trying to say about me, huh? No, these are all signs of an unhealthy gut, which is why today we are both whipping up a gut-loving green smoothie. Hey, 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 and a tasty smoothie as well. Yeah, of course. Flavour always comes first. Now, you and I both know that lifestyle factors play a huge role when it comes to our digestive health. Things like alcohol, stress, smoking, certain medications like antibiotics and a big one, food. Yeah, and we know, Luke, that eating a diet full of fresh fruit and vegetables and always choosing whole food over processed food is a key for healthy digestion. But there are some fantastic foods which are specific in this space, like leafy greens. Uh, I'm bags and kale. Uh, it is all yours because I'm doing spinach, baby. And I'm all over leafy greens as part of every meal. They're an excellent source of fibre, which means regular bowel movements. There you go again with that poo talk. I need some blending white noise to get this out of my head, Luke. So I'll give you a noise in a minute. <laughs> Foods like kale and spinach help to grow the good bacteria in our gut. And that helps to balance the good and bad bacteria in all of us. It's like a healthy little ecosystem. You've got to look after it, Zoe. Our digestive system has such a strong connection to our overall health and other vital processes. Immune system health, energy levels, even mood. And as well as looking after our existing good bacteria, we can turn to probiotics to introduce extra good bacteria into our gut microbiome. And these live microorganisms can be found in fermented foods or supplement form. Look for a high strain probiotic with lots of diverse strains to help support daily gut health. Cheers to that, Loki, and to good gut health. Imagine it came out the same colour. <laughs> I'm not even going to answer that. <laughs> Get Nourished is brought to you by BioGlan Platinum Probiotics, backed by Science, Australia's highest strain probiotic range for digestive and immune system health. Well, next weekend in Melbourne is one of my favourite events on the calendar, the favourite fun run to the House of Wellness. It's run for the kids. It takes place on Sunday, March 19, and raises critical funds for the Royal Children's Hospital and its Good Friday appeal. The event is in its 17th year, and so far they've raised $20 million, and that's money that goes directly to saving lives. Yeah, because all those dollars go towards essential technology, to the care of kids and families, and also to start and aid vital research. Literally tens of thousands of yeah. uh, people are going to take the streets yeah. in Melbourne, including Mario and the Chemist Warehouse <laughs> One Club. They are on fire and they have been joined in recent times by an Australian marathon legend. We noticed a couple of guys on an Instagram post started running and um, I said, oh, that's interesting, um, I might join them. A few more people joined and then it just sort of snowballed from there and then we thought, well, no, there's a good 12 of us here. Let's start a club. We saw the run for the kids coming up in March. Great event to get behind Royal Children's Hospital. So we thought no better cause. Let's go all get together and get behind the run for the kids campaign. Steve Monaghetti here, race director, run for the kids since inception in 2006. So it's been a, a marathon journey, you might say. To be able to give such great uh, support to the Good Friday appeal has been heartwarming. 
but also to see so many people return because they know it's a terrific event supporting such a great cause. We're going to have about 200 participants on the day joining the run club for the run and there's a mixture of short course runners and walkers and a mixture of long course runners. It's going to be very, very big, very exciting. Rule number one is get to the finish line. Rule number two is to do it in an enjoyable way. So the short course is 4.6k, long course is 14.5 kilometres. But also this year, I'm participating, so having that extra aspect of a personal involvement in it makes it just that extra bit special. I've never had the perfect race preparation, but it is the best you can be, and when you get to the start line, it is what it is. I've met Steve Monaghetti before at a younger age. He was my idol and it was great to see him today again and the tips were really valuable to us. You've got this amount of energy in your body. If you sprint, you're going to use too much of it. The tips that I like to share about running is just keep doing it. Even when you don't feel like doing it, you'll get results out of it and it's, it's a great achievement. It never ceases to amaze me, the amount of emotion and families and the support that we get for this event. Two, three. Yeah. Always great to see Australian marathon legend Steve Monaghetti. You know, he broke a world record recently. Over 60 years of age, the fastest 5,000 metres ever what? run for someone. over six, <laughs> Took him 15 minutes, 52 oh, seconds. He is a legend, Steve Monaghetti, and preparing everyone for Run for the Kids, as we know. Yeah. So if you're interested, head for the Run for the Kids website, or better still, turn up and take part. That's all we've got time for today. It's been enjoyable being here at uh, Brighton Beach in Melbourne. Absolutely beautiful, but I'm heading in studio to do House of Wellness Radio this Sunday, as I do every Sunday with Gerald Quigley. And you can check out the House of Wellness Lift Out with lifestyle blogger Rosalia Russian on the cover. Thanks to our friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you again next week.